So where do affine ODEs show up? We've seen their solutions, but what are they really good for? Oh, they're everywhere. They're all over the place. They are as ubiquitous and applicable as their linear counterparts. Recall what we just did. We looked at a general affine ODE, derived the solution by separation and integration. Let's take a look at a few examples where we can put this to work. Let's begin by considering a body, a body that falls. And as it falls, it speeds up, speeds up until it reaches a terminal velocity. Now, wait a minute. Why does that happen? The reason that happens is because you have the gravitational force that is pulling it down, accelerating that body that is opposed by a drag force on that body. That's what's really causing it to hit a terminal velocity. There's a differential equation that describes this. That comes from Newton's second law, which says that the mass times the acceleration is equal to the difference between the gravitational force and the drag force. Let's write that out. Mass times acceleration is mass m times dv dt, where v is the velocity. And then Newton's second says that that's equal to mg minus kappa v, where g is the gravitational constant, and kappa is a drag coefficient. And this drag force is posited to be proportional to the velocity. The faster you go, the higher the drag force. Okay, so we've got this differential equation. It says that the mass times dv dt is equal to the difference between the gravitational and the drag forces. Cool, but notice this is an affine equation. This is some constant of proportionality times v, and then you've got this other constant, mg. We can pull up the general case and its general solution and start matching up the terms. Now that takes a little bit of work. I'm gonna leave that to you to figure out what is the lambda, what is the C. What we get in the end when we match that up is that the velocity V as a function of T is equal to quantity V naught, the initial velocity, minus mg over kappa, all times E to the minus kappa T divided by M. Then we add to that mg divided by kappa. That's the solution. Does it check out? Yes. Plug in t equals zero, you'll get the initial velocity. Plug in t going to infinity, and that negative exponential term goes to zero, and you're left with mg over kappa, the terminal velocity. And we can see from the solution that the difference between the body velocity and the terminal velocity is exponentially decaying in time. All right, that's one example of an affine differential equation, but Here's another. Have you heard of Newton's law of cooling? This is an affine differential equation that applies to a nice, hot cup of coffee that is so hot and delicious, but it cools off so quickly when it's chilly outside. Because of Newton's law of cooling, which states that dt dt, where that first t is capital T, standing for the temperature of the coffee, that is equal to kappa times quantity a minus t, where here kappa is a heat transfer coefficient, something about how insulating your coffee mug is, and capital A is a constant that is the ambient temperature. What's the temperature in the outside environment? Okay, that's our differential equation. It says that the rate of change of temperature is proportional to the difference between the body temperature and the ambient temperature. And this is an affine differential equation, meaning that we can pull up our previous solution. We can match up what's the lambda, what's the C, and write out a general solution for temperature, T, as quantity, T naught minus A, that is the difference between the initial and ambient temperature, times E to the minus kappa T plus capital A. And you can check that out. T is zero, you get the initial temperature. T goes to infinity, you get the ambient temperature. Your coffee has cooled off.
All right, then. That's Newton's Law of Cooling. But have you heard of Newton's Law of Zombies? That's right. It's zombie invasion time. Rawr. And what we have is a population model where the rate of change of the number of zombies, dz dt, z is the amount of zombies in our population, is equal to r times quantity p minus z, where r is a contagion coefficient. How contagious is zombieism? And p is a constant that represents the total population size. This is an infectious disease model. It says that the rate of change of the infected population is proportional to the size of the uninfected population. And notice, this is exactly the same equation as Newton's law of cooling. This is Newton's law of zombies, if Newton had thought about zombies at all. And because it's the same equation, it's affine. It has the same solution. All we need to do is match up the coefficients, and we get that the number of zombies, z, as a function of time t, is equal to z0 minus p times e to the minus rt plus capital P. That means that the zombie population is exponentially approaching the total population size. That's a bummer, man. But that's how infectious disease goes. Now, this is just one model for infectious disease, as we all know too well. There are many, many models for how disease spreads. But step back for a moment. Think about what we've been doing. This is really interesting. We have a single differential equation that winds up being useful in so many different contexts in physics related to falling bodies or temperatures, in population dynamics. What can we do with this differential equation? Can this differential equation be used to model the spread of a disease? Yes. A rumor? Yes. Propaganda? Yes. So many things that you can do with mathematics. This is a great example of why you study differential equations.